Thank you for allowing us a few moments to honor the pastoral team. And thank you for how you bless us, not just on days like today, but this church is very good to, to Amy and I and our family and our pastoral team. We are grateful that we get to serve here and serve the Lord in the capacity that we do. Psalm 126, I want to talk to you on this topic for just a little while today. Originally, I was going to do one more sermon in the Reboot series, but the Lord kind of shifted gears on me on Wednesday night. And if you weren't here on Wednesday night, you missed it. We've been having some incredible times of Bible teaching and discipleship on Wednesday nights right here in the sanctuary. And if you want to go further in the Word, I'd encourage you to be here on Wednesday nights because God's been doing some good stuff. But Amy, we've been talking about daring faith and uh, we talked about the power of our imagination on, on uh, uh, a Wednesday evening, and, and it was just so good. And while we were worshiping the Lord, I, I felt like the Lord said, I want you to go a different direction. And so I'm doing that today. And uh, I'm just, this is a standalone message. This is not a series. We do start our ghost stories uh, series next Sunday morning. For those that are wondering, don't worry, we will not preach about Casper, the friendly ghost. We might mention the Holy Ghost in this series, but uh, no Casper in this. But you'll figure it out when you see some of the texts that we're going to read about what this series is all about. And we hope that you would, you would do that. Maybe seeing a ghost walking on the water or maybe a madman in a graveyard. I just, that may help you a little bit of where we might be going with the series, but we're looking forward to it. But today, I want to talk to you on this topic, the Lord has done great things. The Lord, I feel that right now, the Lord has done great things. Psalm 126. If you don't have a Bible that's leather bound or one that glows, it'll be on the screen for you. When the Lord restored the captives of Zion, we were like those who were in a dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. There's some preaching right there. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Restore our captives, O Lord, as the streams in the south, and those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. That ought to help somebody right there. He who goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed to sow, shall come home again with rejoicing, bringing his grain sheaves with him. The Lord has been good. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the privilege that we have to be in the house of the Lord today. Thank you for the opportunity that we get to uh, hear the word of God preached. Father, thank you for the atmosphere that's been set through the worship. And God, we pray that everything that is done would be pleasing to you. I pray right now that preaching would be easy, enjoyable, and effective. The touch of the Holy Spirit would indeed make the difference. And we are grateful, Lord, for all that you're about to do, all that you've done, things that are ahead. We praise you on credit, God, for, for the things that you're going to do. But, Lord, you have done great things. And we're, we're grateful for that today, Jesus. Now, Lord, help us as we go into the Word now. Open our hearts, open our spirit, let us be receptive, and we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen, amen, you may be seated. The Lord has done great things. Our text is Psalm 126, and it is found right in the middle of a group of psalms, uh, psalms that were grouped together called the Songs of Ascent. Psalm 120 through Psalm 134 are also called the Pilgrim Songs or the Songs of Degrees. Most of the time you'll hear them called as the, the Songs of Ascent. King David is the writer of four of these songs. King Solomon is, is attributed to one of these. And then there were some anonymous writers in the rest of these Songs of Ascent. When you go to the, the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem, and I hope that some of you will choose to go with us. We still have about 15 spots that are available. You will find that Jerusalem is placed high on a hill. Jews traveling to Jerusalem for one of the three main annual Jewish festivals traditionally sang these songs of ascent or the songs to the uphill road towards the city. According to some traditions, the Jewish priests also sang some of these songs of ascent as they walked up the steps to the temple in Jerusalem. 
In fact, as I traveled to Jerusalem this beginning of this year, when we were making the ascent into the city for, the, for about the last 30 minutes until we arrived in Jerusalem, we on the bus began to read these songs of ascent as we were making our ascent into the city. If you go with us in March of 2020, we too will do that exact same thing. As we go into the city, we'll be ascending into Jerusalem and we will read these songs. These songs, they sang, always took them up. That's powerful. For traveling to Jerusalem, you're always on your way up. I have found it amazing that when I get to the house of God, things in my life begin to look up. When I walk into the house of uh, of this sanctuary or the worship center, I know there are things in my life that are troublesome, but yet when I kind of walk into the threshold of this room, I kind of check those at the door and know that things are about to change. I know that when some of you come in here, you're tired, but it's amazing how your strength gets renewed when you get into the presence of the Lord. I I know that some of us, when we come into the room, we have many troubles, but when you start feeling a touch from the Holy Spirit, you begin to settle with your spirit person that everything is going to be all right. I I know that some of you aren't sure how you're going to make it, but when you get into the presence of God, I feel like preaching today, and you hear the word, you just begin to know that God's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. I know that sometimes you don't feel like maybe you have much of a praise in you, but when the music starts, you're ready to lift up your hands, open up your mouth, and give God a sacrifice of praise. I I know that life is tough, and there are moments that you feel like you're about to go under, but in that moment, the master reaches out and touches you, and you realize you're not going under, but you're about to go over. I'm thankful thankful for the songs of ascent. These songs that we see have a theme and they offer us much encouragement. I don't have time to preach every single one of them to you, but let me briefly give you the theme of every psalm of ascent. Uh, Starting with Psalm 120, it's God's presence during distress. Psalm 121 is joyful praise unto the Lord. Psalm 122 is prayer for Jerusalem. Psalm 123 is his patience for God's mercy. Psalm 124, my help comes from the Lord. Psalm 125, prayer for God's blessing upon his people. Psalm 126, for the Lord has done great things. Psalm 127, God's blessings on man affair, on man's efforts. Psalm 128, joy for those who follow God's ways. Psalm 129, a cry for help to the Lord. Psalm 130, a prayer of repentance. Psalm 131, surrender as a child to the Lord. Psalm 132, God's sovereign plan for his people. Psalm 133, praise of brotherly fellowship and unity. Psalm 134, praise to God in his temple. Might I just add right here, if there are moments that you're not sure what song to sing, this would be a good section of the Bible to open up in Psalm 120, just begin to recite the words of the writers of these songs. There are times in our life that we don't feel like we can praise. I encourage you to open up the word of God and begin to read these songs, these psalms unto the Lord and I believe God will begin to put praise into your mouth. In fact, these songs of ascent continue to find place among many of the hymns and songs of worship of Christians today. They serve as powerful examples of how we can express our worship and love for God through the power of song. I know some of you in the room, when it comes to singing, you're a bit challenged. Don't, don't, Don't raise your hand. Don't point down the road. Don't look at anybody. Some of you have changed your seat three times hoping that you can find somebody that's not just making a joyful noise, but that can carry a tune. I get it. But you see, there is powerful things that take place when we worship the Lord through the power of song. Just the next few moments, let me focus in on 126, Psalm 126, about the thought of that Lord has been good. The first thing that we see in our text is that God has been so good, it's like living a dream. 
The Bible said in Psalm 126.1, when the Lord restored the captives of Zion, we were, we were like those who were dreaming or those that were in a dream. The psalmist sang of a time when God set his people free from captivity and they were restored to Jerusalem or Zion with power and with beauty. The poet describes the sense of happy, grateful astonishment at the power and the goodness of God bringing his people back from the captivity and returning to Zion. It seemed too good to be true. It, it seemed too great to be a, a real thing, but the reality was this was indeed their life and it was true. Have you ever just sat and thought about how God has been good to you? Have you ever just paused and taken a moment and realized and thought, Lord, I I'm thankful for how you've been good to me. You have done great things in our lives. Uh, there are times that Amy and I just, uh, at the moment, maybe of times of discouragement or maybe times of not sure of what to do next or, or, or maybe making some pivotal decisions, we just stop and say, can you believe how good God has been to us? He has been so faithful. You see, when I look around my house, I declare that that God has been good to me when I get up out of my bed and let me just say if you got a bed God's been good to you when I get out of my bed and I step into the closet and I, I look at the clothes and I have a choice of what to wear I remind myself that God has been good to me when I go down the steps and I see that old dog come on somebody I know that God still has been good to me I, I make room into the kitchen and I open up the pantry and I've got multiple cereals to choose from Captain Crunch Frosted Mini Wheats Honey Nut Cheerios y'all not saying nothing to me I know that God has been good to me when I think about getting in my truck and I, I crank it up I say God you have blessed me with wonderful transportation when I pull through the city of Huntsville I'm grateful for God how he is blessing our city with economic growth and people from all walks of life and then I happen to pull right here on the parkway and pull into the parking lot and I declare, God, you have been good to us. Thank you for blessing us with this house. Thank you for blessing us with this facility, with this property. And for me getting to pastor these wonderful people, I say to myself, God has been good to me. And I would suggest to everybody in the room today, you need to evaluate from time to time what God has done for your life, in your life, and just say, thank you, Lord, for you have been good to me. That's a good place to give him praise. Hallelujah. In fact, the psalmist said when he wrote here in the text in verse 1, he said, man, this is like a dream. Have you ever said, I know some of you said, no, my life is not a dream, but let me go ahead and tell you, I've been to some places that people would trade your life for theirs right now. I've been to some places where I don't know how people are going to make it. I, they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. And, and, and some of us in this room, you know, we, we get upset if we can't go to the certain restaurant that we want to go to. I didn't understand growing up that sometimes mom and dad, it's not that they didn't want to go out. We just didn't have the money to go out. I mean, there's a reason that we went home and ate ham and cheese sandwiches and, and chips and some soup. But it's better than most. I'm thankful for the goodness of God. God, I thank you for all you've done in my life. And the people who were in captivity, they realized this. Number two, we look at the text, the Bible said that even the nations will know what the Lord has done for you. Now this is powerful. Even the nations will know what the Lord has done for you. This is what the Bible said. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, look, the Lord has done great things for them. And then we said, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. You see, they celebrated the amazing work with laughter and with singing. There was so much laughing that their mouth was filled with it. Have you ever been in the place when something's funny and you can't stop laughing? Not very many people, apparently. Well, y'all need to laugh some more if, if, if that's not you. I mean, ever been so tickled that you, 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 you're laughing so hard that you have to excuse yourself out of a room? I'll never forget, Amy and I, when we were doing uh, birthing classes with, with Lindsay, 
our first, uh, we, we, we uh, met up with this other couple. It was both our first, first uh, uh, child and, and our family. And so we, we sat with them in the, the breathing classes. I don't even know if they do this anymore, but this was, my, this was my day and my experience. And so we would go into this room and we would all lay on the floor. This is weird, y'all. We, we'd all lay on the floor and she'd put on this real soothing music. And this woman really enjoyed her job. She would just say, I want you just to, to lay there and have nothing on your mind. Okay, well, that's, that's the problem number one. Because there's always something on my mind. She goes, I want you just to, I want you now, I want you to reach your arms over your head. Now, we're all laying on the floor. And this is what I'm doing. I'm picturing in my mind all these guys and all these women with stomachs laying on the floor. I'm not sure how we're going to get them up. This is what I'm thinking. We're not supposed to be thinking anything, but this is what I'm thinking. And they said, I want you to stretch and I want you to reach for the stars. When she said reach for the stars, I started laughing. <laughs> and Amy, Amy knows, a Amy and Miles, they have ILS. Y'all don't know what ILS is? It's inappropriate laughter syndrome. They've got ILS, <laughs> laughing at the, the wrong time. Now, I can mask my laughter, but if I make her laugh, w w there's a problem. So this lady kept saying other things, and it wasn't helping. It was making matters worse. And finally the woman said, if you can't be serious, get out of the room. <laughs> Amy couldn't get up, so I had to leave. <laughs> you know, there are moments in our life where laughter is really good. In fact, the Bible says it does good like a medicine. You know, I've seen people, they don't like to laugh. They don't want to laugh. Well, I'm going to tell you, I love to laugh. I love to have a good time. I know when I've got to be serious, but let me be honest with you. I'm not in charge. I love to have a good time. I love to laugh. These people were celebrating the goodness of the Lord that they were so full of laughter and singing, almost laughing to the point of crying. Have you ever laughed so hard that you're wiping tears from your eyes? You can't catch your breath because it's just funny. That's where these people were. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. The mercy was so unexpected, so amazing, so singular that they could not do less than laugh. And they laughed much so that their mouths were full of laughter and because their hearts were full as well. You see, when you begin to think about the goodness of the Lord and everything that God has done for you, it gets into the depth of your spirit. It gets into your belly, and when it releases, it's amazing to see what would happen. Uh, the, you have to realize that the people of God were no longer captives. There was great joy. There was happiness. There was a heart of thanksgiving for what God had done in their lives. It was still fresh in their minds of what God had brought them out of. Sometimes it would do us good to remember what God has brought us out of. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we forget how bad we were. Sometimes we forget how lost we were. And then when we can begin to remember what Christ has done for us, there should be a joy and a happiness and a celebration that rises up within us, but we can't help celebrate what God has done. When you look at Psalm 137, it gives us some insight to where some of these people have been. Listen to what the writer's words said. They said, by the rivers of Babylon, there we, where we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps on the poplars for our captives made us, our captors made us sing and our tormentors made us uncertain saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. And they said, how shall we sing the song of the Lord in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, watch what he said. Let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. And if I don't have Jerusalem as my highest joy. You see, we see the people of God on the shores of likely the Euphrates River. They were sitting there in captivity and they remembered Zion. As they were thinking of home, they missed it terribly and they began to weep. You ever been homesick? Anybody ever been homesick? Sure you have. Don't act like you've never been homesick. 
You've been homesick. You want to come home. You, you, you're ready to come home. You, you get upset. They remembered home. They remembered Zion, and they begin to weep. Their captors wanted them to sing a song. This was a cruel demand of those who had carried them away and, and held them captive. They asked for one of their famous songs. The ones who plundered the people of God now wanted some entertainment by those that they held captive. Yet the Bible said that it was almost as there was no song left in them. Their harps had been hung in the trees. The songs of God's people were more than performances. And that's why when you get on the platform and you sing, it can't be a show. It can't be a performance because if it's a performance, that's what man can get. But if it's an anointed song unto the Lord, come on now, when it's an anointed song unto the Lord, you get what God gets. It's amazing what God can do in that moment. The songs of God's people were more than performances. They came from their relationship with God and the singer vowed that he would never forget God's holy city. In fact, this is what he said. He gave a curse upon himself if he ever did. He said, if I forget, then this right hand would lose its skill to play the harp. If he failed to remember, then his tongue would lose its ability to sing. How dare us come into the house of the Lord and forget what God has done for us and us not open up our mouth and give God a praise that is worthy due to a king. It should be more than a song that we sing. It should be more than a genre. It should be the fact that God has done something incredible for us and we can't help but lift up our hands. We can't help but open up our mouths. We can't help give a shout of praise because we remember our captivity at one moment and now God has brought us out and we're free. It would do us good to remember what God has done for us. Look at it through this type of lens. You see, the psalmist indicates that if I don't sing the song about the goodness and the faithfulness of God, let my tongue no longer be usable for praise. I guess that's why Jesus said, if you don't praise me, the rocks are going to cry out. I, I Don't let me be able to play my instrument. Too many times we come into the house of God with victory and deliverance, but somehow we forget our praise. Walking and healing, but we forget our shout of joy. Breakthrough on the horizon, but we can't even lift our hands and surrender. We need to remember that God has been good to us. And if we remember that, that should give us reason that every time that we walk into this room, our hands automatically go up. Our mouth is already open with praise, regardless of what we're facing. In fact, in Psalm 126, the writer indicates that the nations and the onlook onlookers, the people who didn't even like the people of God said, Look what the Lord's done for them. The people who didn't even like God's people had to look on them and say, look what God has done for them. Can I just insert right here? You know you got it going on. When people are talking about how much God has blessed you and they don't even like you. You know you got something happening in your life. When people look at you and say, Look what the Lord has done for them, and I don't even like them. They've been talking bad about you 30 minutes ago, and then they have to circle back around and say, look what God has done in their life. You know, these people will never tell you to your face, but they can see the goodness of God in life. They might say something like this, I can't stand her, but God sure has been good to her. I don't know where she get all them nice clothes, but it must be the Lord's blessings. I don't know how she got that promotion on her job. I guess it's God's favor. No way she can afford that car, but God must have made a way where there was no way. How in the world did she get that husband? Because we know she don't look good, but somehow the Lord has helped her in some way. You know you've got things working in your life when the enemy has to say, look what the Lord has done for you. I'm looking at some people in this place today that God has favored, that God has done some incredible things to you that even the enemy has to acknowledge God's presence in your life. That's a good place to praise him. The writer of this psalm heard what the, what the nation said, and, and I love what they said. They said, well, I agree with that. They emphasized it in, with repetition. Look, look, look what it said. It said this. Let me read it to you in case you missed it, in case you missed it the first time. He said, then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. And then the writer says, the Lord has done great things for us. And this is what I love. He says, and we are glad. 
It became the declaration of what God had done, the great things that God had done for them. And then they make this, these next three words are important. And he says, and we are glad. And we are glad. I don't know if there are any glad people in the room today. I don't know if there are any glad people in the room today, but you're looking at a glad person in the room today. I'm glad because Jesus came to die for my sin. I'm glad today because he died and I am forgiven. I'm glad today that when Jesus left this earth, he said, it's a good thing that I go because if I go, the Father in heaven going to send the Holy Spirit to comfort you. I, I'm glad today that I've got some joy in my life. I'm, I'm glad today that I've got peace that passes human understanding. I, I'm glad today that I'm walking in victory. I, I'm glad today that Jesus has put a new song in my mouth. I, I'm glad today that he's established my feet on the solid rock. I'm glad today that he woke me up this morning and he started me on my way. I, I'm glad today that I'm able to come into the house of the Lord and stand and breathe and, and give God praise because he's worthy. I'm glad today that I have strength in my body for his service. I'm glad today that I get to preach the gospel message. I'm glad today that I get to worship him with my brothers and sisters in the room. I'm glad today that we have this place that we get to call Life Church Huntsville I'm glad today that somebody's walking out of this room changed. Are there any glad people in the house today? Oh, hallelujah. Are there any glad people today? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad. Come on, look at the other neighbor and say, you weren't second choice, but I'm glad. He said, and we are glad. He, he said that the, the other people see it, the other people know it. And, and I want to affirm it one more time that we are glad for what the Lord has done for us. The Bible said in Psalm 126, 4, number 3, there was a prayer for others in captivity. So you see, the first part of this psalm, the first three verses was, was, about, was about praise. But yet they go from praise to prayer. He said in verse 4, restore our captives, O Lord, as, as the streams in the south. What does this mean? The second half of Psalm 126 does not deny the amazed joy of the first half. They were happy. They were blessed. They were thankful. They worshiped. They knew God had done something for them. But yet they also realized that there was work yet still to be done. The returning exiles, they realized there was much work to do and the restoration, watch this, the restoration had just begun. That's powerful. How many of you still believe and you know that you're thankful that you've been delivered from the bondage of sin but yet there's still work to be done? There's still people's lives that need to be changed. I'm grateful for those that already know Jesus. I'm, I'm grateful that you're in the room today. But there are still people who live in Huntsville, Alabama that need to know about Christ and what Christ has done for us. They need to know that he still saves. They need to know that he still delivers. They need to know that he still can give them a breakthrough. The people of God realized it as well, so they prayed. They prayed this, the streams in the south that flowed, this is what this means. The streams in the south flowed when the rain fell in the faraway mountains and those streams could appear suddenly and rush with a mighty flow sometimes known as flash floods. This is what the psalmist prayed. He prayed for a mighty sudden work of God to further the work of restoration for God's people. What does this mean? He was saying, I want it to flow and I want it to rain and I want, I want the, the, the river of God where there's plenty of water. I want all of, the, all of this to happen so that there would be a flood of God's presence to deliver people from the bondage. I, I'm not sure about you today, but I want a flash flood of his presence in my life and at Life Church Huntsville. Now, I'm not talking about a physical flood. I don't want a physical flood. I want a spiritual flood of his presence to flow in our lives and in this church. I, I, I want his rain to saturate us. 
I want there to be a mighty flow of God's presence in our house. I, I want people that when they pull up in the parking lot that they say, there is something different about this place because I feel something I've never felt before. That's the saturation of God's presence. It's time for us to separate ourselves and go after the glory of the Lord. Moses said in Exodus chapter 33, he said, I beseech you, Lord, show me your glory. He said in that same chapter that if your presence does not go with us, we don't even want to go. We have gotten sometimes so good at church. We've gotten so good at church that we say, God, if your presence shows up, that's good. But if it doesn't, we're going to go on without you. Oh, it's quiet now. We'll maybe get back to praising and glad in just a minute. But here's the reality, family. If we don't have the presence of God, and if the Lord does not build the house, we've built it in vain. Listen, they prayed, God, we want you to saturate us. I was convicted this week. In our council of 18 meetings in our denomination in Tennessee, for those of you who don't know, we're a part of the Church of God denomination in Cleveland, Tennessee. We're very faithful to that. We believe in that. But as we were praying as with an international council, members from around the world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, Europe, and our executive council uh, uh, that, that serves our, our denomination, which I'm fortunate to be a part of, as we were coming together, we were talking about prayer and Pastor Nico, who pastors a church in Indonesia, he, I think his church network now is, I think it's over 250,000, if I'm not mistaken, all the churches in, in Indonesia that he has hand with. That It's amazing to see what they've done. But they pray. I'm going to say that again. They pray. I believe one of the greatest difference in the church in America and the church around the world is they pray. Pastor, you're saying we don't pray? I'm not saying you don't pray. I'm not judging you. But I'm saying they pray. When they call a prayer meeting, the house is packed. We call a prayer meeting. I'll just say it's less than packed. Pastor, you're being mean to us. No, I'm not being, being mean to us. I'm simply saying this. If, if we want God to do something that we've never seen before, we're going to have to do some things that we've never done before. I want to see God saturate this place. I, I, I want to see it so full of the presence and spirit of God that when people come in here with tumors on their neck that they fall off. They disintegrate. They disappear. That ears pop open right in the middle of praise and worship. Y'all not say nothing to me. I, I, I'm talking about they come running to the altar before we ever give an altar call because they need Jesus to save them. I want that type of saturation. And this is what they were praying for. As the streams in the south flow, when the rain falls, it's almost like a flash flood. It's an immersion. It's an overwhelming presence of God. And my prayer for Life Church Huntsville is that is what will be. And the last thing that we see in this text is this, that before your season of joy, there may be seasons of tear. Before your season of joy, there may be a season of tears. Psalm 126, 5 and 6 said it this way. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Mm, I feel that. He who goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed to sow, that shall come home again with rejoicing, bringing his grain sheaves with him. The gladness of the first half of Psalm 26 was real, but only part of the picture. With the wisdom, the psalmist reminds himself and all of us that there, that great joy is often preceded by a season of tears. Catch that. Sometimes before you hit your season of joy, you may go through a season of tears. If some of you are in that season of tears right now, hold on. Whew. If I read it right, weeping may endure for the night. But joy, come on now. Whew. But joy shows up in the morning. It may be several mornings down the road that he shows up, but joy is going to show up. See, the, the, the joy is often preceded by a season of tears as if the, they are seeds, talking about the tears, they are seeds we sow that will bring a crop of joy to be later reaped. Don't underestimate your tears right now. 
Because you're, I believe you're about to reap a season of joy. Oh, I know some of you have been crying. Your pillow's wet at tonight. I, I know some of you have been in your prayer closet and you, you've gone to snub crying. Y'all know what snub crying is, right? <laughs> snub crying. Some of y'all may need to get back to some snub crying. You're crying so hard you can't even talk. Anybody ever, no, nobody but me ever snub crying? Okay, five of us. Praise the Lord. Some of y'all need to get to crying then. I mean, snub crying, can't even talk. I mean, you can't even say a word. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The Bible said tears, season of tears. They are seeds we sow that's going to bring a crop of joy. The idea, watch this, is being repeated and enlarged. Not just crying, then he turns to weeping. Those who have endured much weeping, if they truly carry it as seed for sowing, holding and casting it with faith in God and his promise, those may be assured that they're going to reap a good harvest. I want to encourage somebody in the room. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what all you're going through. You may be crying a whole lot, but just believe that those tears are seeds that you're sowing and there is a harvest that is going to happen that you're going to reap. See, the tears truly sown in faith will bring in a time of true harvest of rejoicing. You know, it's amazing. Sometimes you can go from laughing to crying and crying to laughing all at the same time. You can start crying and you can start laughing, you start laughing, you start crying. I don't know if you've ever done that or not, but, but I have. It's amazing to see that. A true harvest of rejoicing as if the reapers held heavy sheaves of grain. You've got to get the picture. That these tears that they've sown the seeds, that what they say in the way of harvest, they're holding heavy sheaves of grain saying it's not going to be a small harvest, but it's going to be a large harvest. This is a powerful and great promise that our tears and our sorrow is not wasted. But it can be sown for a joyful harvest received in a better season. So if you're in a season of tears, take courage, friend. That there is a harvest coming. That's going to be better. I want somebody to come play for me so I'll try to wind this thing down. I want to encourage you today. You may be in a season of many tears. But no, they are like seeds that are being sown to bring about a great harvest. I know some of you shed tears over that son or that daughter. Seeds are being sown. I know some of you are shedding tears over that lost spouse. You're doing your best to compose yourself on the other side of the bed as they, they lay over there sleeping soundly and you are burdened for their soul. Keep crying those tears for seeds are being sown. I, I, I know some of you are maybe in a difficult situation or season and you're trying to get direction from the Lord and the only thing that seems, seems that you're getting is more tears, more tears, more tears, more tears. I want to encourage you. Seeds are being sown. I believe, according to what I read in Scripture, that a harvest is going to be reaped. Don't ever underestimate the power of your tears. I can remember, and I'll close with this, I remember times in my life when my dad was my pastor. It was early in my childhood. He was my pastor, all, all that I remember, until about the fourth grade. And I remember sitting by my mother, because we didn't, we didn't have life kids in the church that I was in. We, we didn't have that type of ministry. Thankful for life kids. What they teach, how they train, what they do. But see, I sat in big church. You know, every now and then, it would, we do this from time to time, but it's good for kids to sit in big church. But I'd be sitting there with my coloring sheet. I'm sure it was a great picture because I was a good colorer. Not really. But all of a sudden, from time to time, I remember catching myself looking over at my mother. And she would have her hands raised. She wasn't saying a whole lot. That, that tongue and that mouth was stammering in that prayer language that God had given her. It wasn't loud where everybody could hear her. 
He wasn't boisterous. But then I would look up. And I would look at her eyes. And I would just see the flood of tears. Rolling down her cheeks so strongly that the tears were gathered on her chin. Some would fall to the carpet. Some she would wipe away with her Kleenex or a handkerchief. But then her hand would go right back up. And those tears would just begin to flow. I often wondered what mom was praying about. But I never asked her. Maybe I should sometime. So mom, if you're watching, maybe you can tell me. But I'll never forget the impact of those moments in my life as a young man. To see a mom, hands lifted, tears running down her face, speaking in a prayer language that God had given her. And going right back to what I was doing. Somehow in that moment there was just a peace. I don't know why I'm sharing this with you today, honestly. Other than I want to tell you, in moments where maybe it's difficult to open up your mouth and praise, it's never difficult to lift your hands. It's never difficult to to lift your hands, and if you're full of the Spirit of God, let the Spirit of God bear witness to you and speak. And in those moments, the tears, I really believe this, And if you don't, that's fine. But since I got the mic, I'm going to tell it my way. I believe the Lord is moved. I believe the Lord is moved when his sons and his daughters, yes, worship him. But yes, when they lift up their hands. And sometimes the only thing that can happen in that moment is just the shedding of tears. I bet he gathers his angels around and says, Look at my kids. Look how they're moved with emotion because of the goodness in their life. Look at how they're moved with tears because they know they're going through something. But you just watch this. There are seeds that are being sown in this moment. And they are going to reap a harvest if they don't faint. Won't you stand to your feet? Here's what we're going to do. This is how I feel we're going to close today. I know what I'm going to need to do and we're going to be sensitive to the Spirit but I'm not, I'm not looking for anything in that way if you know what I'm saying. Here's what I want us to do. Everybody that's willing, I want you just to right now, I want you just to lift up your hands if you're willing. Not because I'm asking you, just because you're willing and you want to surrender to the Lord. We're not going to sing any song. I just want you to play just like you're playing right now. We're not singing a song. But I want you to in your own way in this moment. Can you just worship the Lord? Can you thank Him for the goodness in your life? Say, Pastor, right now I can't focus on too much goodness because of what I'm facing. Then you're going to have to go back in your memory bank. You're going to have to go back in your memory bank and pull something that you know that the Lord has done for you. Come on, can you do it right now? If you're a guest, we're a Pentecostal church. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's just the prayer language God has given me. Don't, don't let it bother you or upset you. It's just we're, we're allowing the Spirit of God to speak in us and through us. Come on, family. Would you just worship Him? Some of you are about to shed some tears. It's, I'm telling you, you're going to sow some seeds in these tears. Don't make them show up. But if it happens, allow it to flow. Some of you need to let some things go in this moment. Some of you are holding on to some bitterness. Some of you are holding on to to some resent. Some of you are holding on to some offense. It's time to let it go and allow joy to knock at your door. Oh, my son, Baba Ye. This is what the psalmist said. This is what he said. When the Lord restored the captives of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouth was filled with laughter. Our tongue was singing. 
Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Restore our captives, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who goes forth and weeps, bearing precious seed to sow, shall come home again with rejoicing, bringing his grain sheaves with him. Father, thank you for your word today in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to reflect on the goodness of the Lord. Thank you, God, for what you've done. And I pray for those right now that might be in that season of tears. Help them stay encouraged because they are sowing seeds and joy is on the horizon. There's some, room, there's some people in this room, I sense right now in my spirit, there's some people in this room who have been wronged. And every night, their focus is how they've been wrong and how do I let it go and how do I move forward. I pray in the name of Jesus, let those tears that they have released, let it be seeds that have been sown and let joy and provision and help and health and wholeness be theirs. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you want to put your hands down now, you can. If you say, Pastor Kevin, I need this Jesus that would love me so much that he would leave 99 and come after me. I need this relationship. I, I don't have it all figured out, but I need him in my life. I need him as a savior. I, I, I've tried to fill the void, the, what I've been searching for. I've looked in a lot of places, but I, I can't find it, and I, I need him. I, it seems like you keep talking about this Jesus that's changed you, and I need him. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you slide up your hand right where you are, and we want to pray for you. Is there anybody? Yes, ma'am, I see you. Right in the middle, I see you. Is there anybody else? I see you over here. The others in the middle. Anybody else? Say, pray pray for me, Pastor. Pray for me. I, I need you to pray for me. I've seen about four hands go up that I've seen. Maybe some more. I see one in the back over there, five. Come on, pray this prayer with me. Come on, everybody pray this prayer with me. Come on, say, Father, Father I, know I'm in sinner, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm in need of a Savior. I'm in need of a Savior. I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus that you are that Savior. You are that Savior. You came to the earth. Came to the earth. You went to the cross. You went to the cross. You shed your blood. You shed your blood. You died. You died. You were buried. You were buried. But you rose again. But you rose again. Just like the Bible says. Just like the Bible says. I need you to forgive me. I need you to forgive me. Of all my sin. Of all my sin. I believe that you're doing it now. I believe that you're doing it now. And I confess you. And I confess you as Lord, as Lord, as Savior, as Savior of my life, of my life, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, here's what the Bible says, that if we confess with our mouth and we believe, I, I add, if we believe in our mind and in our heart, that he is faithful. Who's he? Jesus. It's faithful to forgive us of all unrighteousness. What's that? Sin. And now your name is written in a book called The Lamb's Book of Life, which you want it to be in. But here's the thing, that once you get saved, you've got to start on your journey of faith. There's going to be some people in the back and up front on the sides that want to give you something, that want to help you in your journey of faith. They want to tell you what to do next. First of all, you need to find a church that believes in the Bible. Well, we do that. You need to find a church where you're going to hear the Word of God preach. You're going to be a part of worship. You're going to meet friendly people. I, we do that too. You need to find a place where you can connect, where you can find people who are just like you, different colors, different, different economic statuses, some that have been to a buffet like me, some who are real skinny. We got that too. You need to find a place where you can connect. And guess what? We want you to connect here. If that's what God wants for your life, and we want to help you in your journey of faith, and we want to grow together. So I want you to find one of them before we go. I want to pray one more prayer. I'm going to let you go. But I just want you to remember this, this thought. The Lord has been good. So, Pastor, you don't know what's happened to me in my life. No, I don't. But maybe some of the things that happened to you might should be dead, but yet you're still living. There might have been some people who have said some things about you that you'll never amount to anything, that you were a mess up, that you were a screw up. You should have never been born. But let me tell you, God put you in this room today to hear the Lord has been good to you and he's got a plan and a purpose for your life and we're so glad you walked through the doors of this house to hear that word. I'm telling you, it's not an accident that you're here. 
Red, yellow, black, white, a lot of hair, no hair. God sent you here. Father, bless your people. Bless your people. Yamo Samba, ye beyond the Bless your people. Bless our guests today. Bless them who don't even, maybe they never even stepped foot in a Pentecostal church. But I pray that they'll sense your presence and know that you're real and that you love them, that you care for them. And there's people in this house that love them and are going to care for them and going to help them. We're not perfect, but we want to help them in their journey of faith. Now, God, I, I need you to go with them. I pray they'll never get away from this message. And, Father, if they're in the season of sowing tears, just let them remember this message. Tears are being sown, but joy's coming. Hey, joy's coming. Ah, ooh, Moshe. Mm, it's coming. Hey, I feel that. In the name of Jesus, I come against the enemy that would battle people's minds and say you're never coming out of this season, but I declare you're coming out. Hey, you're coming out of this season in the name of Jesus. Uh, you're coming out of this season. You're coming out of this season. I, I see you stepping through a, a new door into a new season uh, in the name of Jesus. I feel it. I see it. And we thank you, God, for what you're doing right now. Right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, one more time. Lift your hands. I'm not going to be favor. I'm going to let the people go. Come on, come on, lift your hands one more time. Come on, one more time. Bless them before we get out of here. Come on, bless them from your heart. Bless them one more time for you. Some of you are recalling right now something else God's done for you. God, thank you for protecting me in that car wreck when I hydroplaned out the road. Thank you, God, for being with me. Thank you, God, for a couple times that I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but yet you still spared me. I praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for some decisions that I made that could have altered the course of my life, but yet somehow you got me on the right road again. I praise you. I, I, it's coming back to me, Lord. It's coming back to me. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for letting me preach. Thank you, God, for letting me worship. Thank you, God, for the things that you've done. You've been good to me. And I bless you in this place. Hallelujah. Bless your name, O God. I praise you now. I praise you now. And you're worthy. You're worthy. Now here's what I want you to do. If you're a guest in the room, get to guest connections. We want to put a gift in your hand. We want to say hey to you. If you don't know somebody around you, come on, open up your mouth and say hello and introduce yourself. But if you're a guest, come on back, be with us. I can't wait to see what God's going to do. Ghost Stories next Sunday, launch a new series. You're going to have to come and see what it's all about. You're going to have to come and see. God bless you is my prayer. Father, thank you. Seal everything that's been done now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day, great week. The favor of God, the blessing of God rest upon you. Amen.